there is no such thing as waste in nature. Everything is going back into the circle of life. Waste is a human construct. We use something once and we throw it to this place called away, which also does not exist. It's this imaginary place. It's a landfill in somebody's backyard. It's a waste energy facility. It's a recycling facility. The way we have been doing this management of solid waste and materials and recycling, we have to figure out a different way to do it. I always thought there should be some thing that pulled people together that are thinking differently about this challenge. I'm Mark Lichtenstein. I'm the Executive Operating Officer for the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at SUNY. I'm also the principal investigator for the New York State Center for Sustainable Materials Management. I became aware of an interest by the state to do something focused on recycling market development. I use that as an opportunity to try to leverage this bigger idea. The Center for Sustainable Materials Management was founded in 2020. It was the work of Mark Lichtenstein who brings that desire and passion for really challenging these complex issues. My name is Kate Walker. I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Sustainable Materials Management at SUNY ESF. The goal of the center is really to lead and inspire and connect a diverse group of organizations across New York State looking to reimagine what waste as a concept is. Part of the reason that we developed the center was to bring all of these puzzle pieces together of people working on sustainable materials management, but not necessarily connecting. It's about bringing people to the table that range from deeply focused researchers and scientists to communication experts. We have universities doing incredible research. We have businesses trying to create actual sustainable solutions. And then we have municipalities working directly with people to try to better their lives. We're here to make those connections and to tell the story of innovation that's happening throughout New York State. How do we think differently? How do we improve communication? and bring people together while also pushing the envelope, <laughs> saying we don't have to always do it this way and this other way may actually benefit more people. Beginning in 2017 and really feeling it in 2018, the recycling markets crashed. The vast majority of materials around the globe were being exported to China. And China was able to say, we don't want to take this material anymore because it wasn't just pure recycling. We we're really just exporting garbage. And they said, no, we aren't gonna take this stuff. So 50% of the entire market for recovered paper dropped overnight. And that just sent recycling programs down into levels that we had never seen before. And so DEC recognized the most important thing was quality. It was quality over quantity, really focusing on what to recycle and how to recycle and how to support the local municipalities getting that message out. We're really fortunate to have the funding of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that saw this need to connect one another and solve some of these complex problems. There's no shortage of challenges when it comes to managing materials that people don't want to have anymore. It's been very challenging because you are not responsible for that product after you put it in your can at the end of the driveway. And it becomes the responsibility of whatever entity to be able to manage. 
Most of the United States has moved to what is called a single stream municipal solid waste collection. All of your plastic, your cardboard, your glass, your metals, all of that is collected and put into the same bin. Because of that, it's much more energy efficient and economically more efficient as well. You're gonna have a truck come up and pick up that tote of mixed recyclable materials, and it's gonna take it to a MRF, which is a materials recovery facility. That's where it gets processed. At that facility, they're able to segregate all of the materials. You may be able to have more advanced technologies to make sure that that sorting and that segregation is very efficient. We definitely could be utilizing certain technologies more to achieve higher recycling rates and want to make sure that consumers are also putting the right materials in those bins. The big goal is to reduce the amount of materials going to landfills. We've got stuff going into disposal facilities that are, you know, you can argue are managed well for the most part, but it's still really an archaic way to do this. Seriously, we still have landfills. We're still throwing stuff into the ground. That's the best technology that we have. There needs to be additional innovation and in research and development on how better to sustain markets for these valuable materials that we're recovering at the curbside, but don't have strong domestic markets because of the dependency on an export market, which is where the Center of Sustainable Materials Management really came out of recognizing the expertise that our SUNY systems provide to help solve some of these big challenges for today and into the future. SUNY ESF, with our forestry department and understanding fibers and paper, we have an expertise in this area. How do we elevate and address some of the challenges around recycling paper and cardboard? Looking at that material and saying, this definitely does not belong in a landfill. There must be something that we can do with that. It's really recognizing that all of these materials that we use they all have a beginning, have a middle, have an end, and then they come back around. Nothing just goes away. So it's really important to start at the source. How do we come across materials that are sustainable, that are truly biodegradable? For this, we actually take our cue from nature. My name is Bandaru Ramarao. I go by the name Ram, and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and also the chair of the department currently. What a tree does is it takes carbon out of the atmosphere holds it together, and then when it decays, it releases it back into the atmosphere. So you have a nice circular wheel going on where your carbon is going in and out of the atmosphere. On the other hand, you take your regular plastic, the carbon that that was made out of, you've taken that out and you've pumped it into the air. Now the atmospheric load of carbon has increased, and that's really what is causing the problem. Waste is the fourth largest category and contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Landfills emit methane for years and years and years. So waste that you avoid putting in a landfill today is going to reap huge benefits to the climate for years to come. The solution is perhaps to make your materials out of this freely available carbon that is actually going round and round in the atmosphere and to look for materials which will actually do this degradation. Your raw material is part of the sustainability. The largest fraction of municipal solid waste turns out to be paper fibers. Paper and cardboard are super recyclable. We're doing a good job there. What a lot of people don't know is after you recycle cardboard around eight to 10 times, there is a waste product that comes out of that. These fibers, each time you recycle them, you're actually stiffening them. Eventually, 
they tend to break into pieces. These loose pieces could be a substantial resource instead of just either landfilling them or burning them. We are trying to come up with new materials, new ways to get at the very core chemistry and make them into something else. We found that you can actually mix the waste material from paper industries with food waste, oils and so on. And then you can actually make unique and novel kinds of bioplastics or biodegradable plastics. The paper maker has a few options of how to deal with these small particles. The landfill option serves nobody. It doesn't serve the environment, it doesn't serve society, and it doesn't serve the economics. Converting these fines into the bioplastics, that's a local solution. That's a solution that can happen very easily. And that is where the kind of projects that we are working on are going to be quite useful. So it's going to be our PHA, but then we're going to add surfactant. It's the circularity of the entire system, and being able to utilize this material is really important to us. Sustainable materials management is trying to help us get away from thinking of these things as waste items, but yet they're materials. They were made out of something. They're precious. There was an intensive process used, and let's keep that going through this kind of circular process. This is still viewed as a waste management process in many cases, as opposed to a materials recovery process. So part of this is moving the needle on the philosophy. I'm Doug Daly. I'm an associate professor at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. I'm dealing with recovering non-marketable papers from the current waste stream and diverting them into compost. Our team is looking at composting those items that are paper or cardboard that are difficult to recycle. Things like wax corrugated paper. Paper egg cartons, tubes inside of paper towels and toilet paper. Toilet paper, Kleenex, napkins, freezer boxes, cereal boxes, food packaging. Wax coatings, inks, make it very challenging to actually recycle those materials. So there's a lot of good fiber there, but because of all the other things, it doesn't get into the recycling stream. Paper is principally carbon. Carbon is an essential feedstock for composting operations. We've got energy and we've got nutrients embodied in that paper product. We should use it to its highest and best use. So the how? We adopted the use of surfactants. Surfactants are very common in soaps and detergents. It reduces the surface tension of water. The more water that's available to the microbes, the more successful we can be in degrading whatever paper product we put in there. After 90 days, compost. How do we prove that this works? Well, we look at carbon dioxide respiration, which is an indication of biological activity. We can see differences in that biological activity depending on how much cardboard we add, how much surfactant we add, and draw our conclusions from that. The good work that Doug Daly is doing with composting and taking a look at these paper residuals, really cool cutting edge stuff that also is making a really beneficial product in the end that could be used for agricultural purposes and soil augmentations. One of the first challenges that we face is where are the feedstocks coming from and how much is available. We are so excited to be able to have so many partners in research across New York State, whether it be University of Buffalo working on plastics or the waste characterization work happening at SUNY Stony Brook. David Tonjes at Stony Brook has been tasked for the last few years to do an intensive statewide effort to characterize what's in the waste stream looking at how much paper and what types of paper are currently in the waste streams of various municipalities so that we can get a handle on what do we got to target first. 
what's really important is to know exactly what is in the garbage, what is in the recycling bin. It's very difficult to measure. And so the waste quantification and characterization work that SUNY Stony Brook is doing is very important. So we can target where the largest amount of material, where we can make the biggest difference. And so we're really looking forward to getting that data. I've always been interested in how you count things. Counting things can be very difficult. This is even true for garbage, which is very tangible. It comes in big piles. It's collected in containers. You'd think that it would be a relatively simple thing to count and to count well. But this has proven to be technically difficult and intellectually stimulating. I'm Professor Elizabeth Hewitt. I'm in the Department of Technology and Society at Stony Brook. I am a social scientist and an urban planner, so my work looks more at the policy and behavioral side. One of the projects that I'm working on looks at social norms in recycling. What kinds of policies help people make better decisions so that they understand more about the waste stream? There's often a disconnect between what people intend to do and want to do in their actions. I'm very interested in ways to connect that gap. David is my colleague in the Department of Technology and Society, so we work collaboratively on basically all of the waste efforts. We do sampling work across New York State. Our students are hands-on, they're out digging through the materials so that we can have a better understanding of what people are throwing out and what they're recycling. One of the central activities in our research is to take physical garbage and to put it into different bins and buckets, into different categories. They break those categories down into many micro-levels. By the end of their analysis, we should be able to know how much non-marketable paper is in a municipal waste stream. The way we live our life is expressed in the things that we buy and then the things that we ultimately discard, and we get to see a lot of that. If we can talk coherently about what's in solid waste, then there's the chance that we can manage it better. In Alfred, New York, we're about an hour south of Rochester, an hour and a half from Buffalo, and a little over two hours to Syracuse. Right in the heart of the southern tier and near the Finger Lakes region, and an area that really could use some help in terms of economic development and to draw people here for these kinds of jobs and positions. I'm Gabrielle Gausset. I'm the Dean of the Kazua Inamori School of Engineering here at Alfred University. Right now, we've undertaken a major project on glass recycling. Glass can be a real challenge at end of life. It's one of the only materials that can't be compacted in some way. So glass causes so many challenges as material recovery facilities. All of your metals and your plastics and your cardboard, they end up there, they get separated, and then they're able to be baled or palleted into these nice little very transportable containers and move on to where they're gonna be processed. Glass is one of the few materials that ends up at those facilities where you can't do that with it. It's gonna break and it's gonna mix into all of the other material streams as well. And that's why here in the United States, the recycling rate for glass is really quite low. 
We produce about 24 billion pounds of glass waste. Sadly, only about 20% of that glass material is going to end up back in container glass. So our team here at Alfred University is really working on ways to increase the utilization of recycled glass cullet. Glass that's collected at the curbside, it's not necessarily the best for turning back into container glass, but other materials could be used for drainage, for other applications to make sure that that glass is kept out of the landfill and put to another next best life. So it's about keeping these items in the economy and continuing to refurbish the economy, so made into new materials and creating jobs along the way. We have sets of researchers that are focusing on melt technologies. We have a team that's working on sorting and segregation possibilities to use glass cullet as an aggregate in different concrete and cement mixes, photoluminescence in road bases. The concrete and cement industry is actually one of the largest environmental impact industries that we have. If we can get it right on the research side and make sure that there's a great pathway there, then that's really going to be a win-win-win situation. Sustainable economic development, sustainable environmental stewardship, and social equity. It is a way to make communities more sustainable. Attack solid waste first, and you get all these ancillary benefits that come with it. We're very excited to see a lot of what we're doing in the labs come to life to be prototyped and piloted in this area and to then impact New York State as a whole. And when New York State becomes a clear leader in this area, being able to have an impact at the national level. Working in sustainable materials management, you at times can feel like you're buried in a lot of stuff because there's so much change that needs to happen and there's so much material that we need to deal with but that's constantly being created. The hope is in the people that we're working with. and the aha moments that we find when we're working with students. In so many ways, you can actually see the change that you're making. If you're making a compost pile, it only takes a few months in your backyard to see how a banana peel turns into soil that you can use to actually grow food. If you want to see what happens to the recyclables that you put into your recycling bin, you can see what happens to that aluminum can when you put it in the recycling bin and it works its way through the MRF and then to manufacturing for a renewed product. The solutions are so tangible and real that the younger generation really latches onto it because they know that it's time for change. They know they can make change this way. Melissa Young is doing a great job with her team at Syracuse University, taking on the whole education and the outreach and the communication piece and the Recycle Right campaign, which has just hit high gear. It's important to have a strong education, outreach, and engagement component. There's a huge knowledge gap on how to properly deal with materials and where materials come from. We have a partnership with the Center for Sustainable Community Solutions. We're looking at creative ways of engagement and how we message and connect. Right now, recycling rules vary all throughout New York State. So it's really important to know your local guidelines to recycle right. I'd love to really make what we do more prevalent in popular culture in TV, in movies, more social media, wherever people are getting their entertainment, 
This map was recently released by the EPA. I want it to be everywhere. These plotted points represent potential glass recycling opportunities across the state. I have great hope for the center. I have great hope for what we're doing. I'm seeing a lot more energy and creativity coming from younger professionals. Mark has a lot of faith in younger people to get the work done. They are physically and mentally and spiritually <laughs> capable of taking on the burden of materials management, helping to spread the stewardship aspect of it, building this huge coalition of stewards throughout New York State, across the country, whether it be a recycler in a small community or the hauler or the mayor or the governor, we all know that these challenges are existing and how can we actually implement solutions in a way that inspires folks to make informed choices. Positive difference is gonna happen through the people that are involved. What we work towards every day is how to connect people, how to be connected to people. More than anything, I want people to feel like they can be part of this effort.